Hello, and welcome to the channel. Halloween, a tradition that began as long as 2000 years ago, where ancient Celts would light fires and wear costumes to ward off ghosts, has today become more of a commercial event, with children donning spooky outfits, trick or treating, and hoping to score some decent sweets to take home to eat. Many urban legends have come to rise over the years from mass murderers, haunted homes, and poison suites. Today, we'll be looking at the last one. While the legend of candy being laced with poison, razor blades, or even hallucinogenic drugs is a popular urban legend in America, there are no reports that suggest that this is actually true. That is, unless you take into account the one time it did happen. If you've just brought your child home from trick-or-treating, you might want to get them to hold off eating their sweets for a little while. Let's begin. Texas, Halloween, 1974. Once the sun had set, children set about their evening trick-or-treating, dressed in their spookiest attire, hoping to get a large stash of sweets to take home to enjoy. One of those children was Timothy O'Brien. Eight-year-old Timothy was out trick-or-treating with his five-year-old sister, Elizabeth, and his father, Ronald. While visiting homes in search for candy, one of the Pasadena homes they visited failed to answer the door. Timothy and Elizabeth grew impatient and left to continue their hunt for sweets elsewhere. Ronald, however, stayed behind for a moment. After a short time, the door opened, where a hand passed over sweets to Ronald to take to his children. Five 21-inch pixie sticks. Timothy and Elizabeth excitedly accepted a pixie sticks each from their father, who also gave two pixie sticks to his neighbour's two children, and the fifth one he gave to a ten-year-old boy he recognised from his church. When the O'Briens arrived home, Timothy and Elizabeth compared their spoils, while also getting ready for bed. But before they did, Timothy asked his parents if they could have one sweet before bed. Ronald said they could, and handed his son the pixie sticks he said his son had chosen. After helping him open the straw, Timothy ate some of the candy. Almost instantly, Timothy said that the sweet tasted unusually bitter, and so Ronald brought him some Kool-Aid to wash away the bitterness. However, moments after consuming the sweet, Timothy began to complain that his stomach hurt. He ran to the bathroom, where he began to vomit. Within minutes, Timothy was convulsing on the bathroom floor. His parents called 911, but before they could arrive, young Timothy had gone limp in his father's arms. An ambulance arrived minutes later and rushed Timothy to hospital, but he died en route, less than an hour after eating the pixie sticks. The circumstances behind Timothy's death immediately caused authorities to suspect that something nefarious was behind the young boy's untimely end. Their suspicions would be confirmed when it was revealed during Timothy's autopsy that he had died as a result of cyanide poisoning. Tests on the pixie sticks Timothy ate revealed enough cyanide in it to kill two adults. The news of young Timothy's death sent shockwaves throughout the local area. After learning that Timothy had been poisoned, parents turned over sweets their children had collected, fearing that these two had been laced with poison. Not only this, police had to track down the other pixie sticks handed out to the other kids that night. Recovering Elizabeth's was easy enough. She hadn't eaten any of it, and neither did their neighbour's two children. However, for the ten-year-old who received the last pixie sticks, his parents were unable to locate it. Fearing their child had consumed it, they rushed to his bedroom, where they found him asleep, holding the pixie sticks. 
Unfortunately, he too had not eaten any, but this was only because he was unable to open the tube. Tests were carried out on the recovered pixie sticks, where it was discovered that these two were laced with cyanide, enough to kill three or four adults. They also noted that the pixie sticks had been stapled shut after being tampered with. Police, wanting to know the house that gave Ronald the tainted candy, took Ronald around the area where they had been out trick-or-treating that fateful night. But for some reason, Ronald was unable to recall where the house in question was. He also confirmed that on the night, he didn't see the face of the person who handed him the pixie sticks, as they had opened the door slightly, only revealing their arm, which he described as being hairy. It wouldn't be until three attempts by the police to retrace Ronald's steps that he finally located the house in question. The man who occupied the home, Courtney Melvin, was an air traffic controller at William P. Hobby Airport. Courtney told police that on Halloween, he was working at the time Ronald claimed to have visited, leaving just his wife and daughter at home. His wife explained that the lights had been switched off early due to them running out of candy. Police checked out his alibi, which couldn't have been more concrete, after almost 200 people confirmed that Courtney had indeed been where he said he was. Needless to say, Courtney was quickly ruled out. With this line of inquiry complete, it was reasonable to assume that nobody had broken into Courtney's home to dish out dodgy Halloween treats without Courtney's wife and daughter being aware. Instead, police now had come to the realisation that the person responsible was much closer to Timothy than first thought. They began to look into Ronald Clark O'Brien himself. Investigators got to work with looking into Ronald and spoke with his neighbour, Jim Bates, who was out with Ronald and his two children trick-or-treating that night. Jim explained that he would wait on the path while Ronald accompanied the children to the doors. At the house in question, there was a wall concealing the front door. He confirmed that the children left the door without Ronald, who emerged from behind the wall moments later, holding the pixie sticks. Jim went on to explain that on that Halloween night, they had only taken their children to two streets, as it had begun raining, forcing them to turn back and head home. This raised suspicions, as Ronald should have had no issue retracing his steps with them, instead of having to make three trips. Authorities would dig deeper into Ronald's personal life, exploring his financial circumstances, the results which left them more concerned that they were on the right path. Between 1964 and 1974, Ronald O'Brien had held 21 jobs. He was also terrible with money, owing around $100,000 at the time, equivalent to approximately $520,000 today. His car was close to being repossessed. He had defaulted on multiple loan payments. Their home had been foreclosed on, and to top it off, his latest job was under threat after he was suspected of stealing. More worryingly for the investigators, they would learn that O'Brien took out life insurance policies on both Timothy and Elizabeth. In January 1974, he had initially taken out a $10,000 policy, which he then added another policy worth $20,000 on a month before Timothy's death. His life insurance agency raised objections over this, but O'Brien persisted. Then just days before Timothy was poisoned, O'Brien took out yet another $20,000 life insurance policy on each of his two children, thus bringing the overall total to around $60,000. When police discovered these policies, they checked with his insurers, who confirmed that at 9am on the 1st of November, just hours after Timothy had died, Ronald had called to inquire about the payout. Detectives also learned that before Timothy was poisoned, O'Brien had been openly boasting to his Texas State optical colleagues 
that his financial health would, quote, soon undergo a remarkable recovery, end quote. One of O'Brien's customers, a chemist, also told police that Ronald would question him about poisons, especially potassium cyanide, even asking his customer where he could purchase the poison. The obsession with potassium cyanide continued. At the time, Ronald was attending community college, where he quizzed his professor with questions such as, what is more lethal, cyanide or another type of poison? Additionally, another witness would come forward. This witness, who worked at a chemical company in Houston, told police that a man had stopped by to purchase potassium cyanide, but left empty-handed after discovering that the smallest amount he could buy was £5 worth. The witness, while unable to identify O'Brien by face, distinctly remembered him wearing a beige or blue smock, which lined up with the uniform he wore at his job at Texas State Optical. Now armed with a warrant, police searched the O'Brien household. A pair of scissors was found, with plastic residue attached, which resembled the residue found on the pixie sticks. Ronald Clark O'Brien was arrested on the 5th of November 1974, less than a week after Timothy was killed. He was indicted on one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. O'Brien denied all charges. During his trial, the prosecution would argue that O'Brien murdered his own son to cash in on his life insurance policies. They also believed he hoped that Elizabeth would also fall victim to the poison candy in order for him to collect her insurance policies too. As for why he gave other children candy, they argued that Ronald did this because if other children died, he believed it would throw the police off his scent. Essentially, they were collateral damage. His wife stated that she was unaware of the insurance policies and that on the night Timothy was poisoned, he didn't choose the pixie sticks. Instead, she suggested that Ronald forced him to choose it instead. Ronald's brother and sister-in-law also testified, telling the court that on the day of Timothy's funeral, O'Brien told them he would use the insurance money to take a long holiday and to go on a spending spree. Meanwhile, the defence would lean on urban legends, in particular one about a mad poisoner who would poison candy or lace them with razor blades, pinning the blame on this mystical figure. Eyes Around America all watched the trial unfold. On the 3rd of June 1975, after just 46 minutes, the jury would return with a guilty verdict, and it took them just another 71 minutes to sentence him to death by electric chair. Soon after he was sentenced, Ronald O'Brien's wife filed for divorce. His first execution date was scheduled for the 8th of August 1980, but this was postponed after Ronald's attorney was able to petition for a stay of execution. His execution date was rescheduled for the 25th of May 1982, but this was also postponed. When the third execution date was scheduled for the 31st of October 1982, eight years to the day Timothy O'Brien was killed, the judge arranging the execution, Judge Michael McSpadden, offered to personally drive O'Brien to the death chamber. By now, O'Brien was scheduled to be executed by lethal injection, the first of its kind in Texas at the time. Reverend Carol Pickett, who was a former chaplain at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, stated that O'Brien was shunned and despised by his fellow death row inmates. Understandably, the reason for this was for taking the life of his own son. Pickett described O'Brien as absolutely friendless, and the inmates even reportedly wanted to hold a demonstration on the day of his execution, just so they could express their utter hatred for him. The October 82 execution date was also delayed, 
after the Supreme Court allowed O'Brien a chance to appeal for a new trial. In the meantime, a new date of the 31st of March 1984 was arranged. O'Brien's attorney would attempt to seek a fourth stay of execution, arguing that death by lethal injection was cruel and unusual. But this was rejected by the federal judge at the time, on the 28th of March 1984. Three days later, the date had finally arrived. Protesters who opposed the death penalty gathered outside the Huntsville unit where the execution was to take place, but counter-protesters had also gathered in their numbers. In total, there were about 300 people in attendance that day. Before his execution, O'Brien made a final statement. In it, he said, quote, What is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years. I pray and ask your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us, respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you one and all. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. End quote. After he was executed, the crowd celebrated by shouting trick or treat, and they also threw candy at the anti-death penalty protesters. It took the residents of Texas many years to get over what Ronald O'Brien did to his son. To achieve his goals of getting hold of their life insurance policies, he would invoke the urban legend of a mad poisoner to get his way, even going as far as to potentially kill other children and implicate others. Over the years, Ronald O'Brien has earned numerous nicknames, such as the Pixie Sticks Killer and the Candyman. However, for many, he will always be remembered as the man who killed Halloween. What I found interesting while researching this case was just how widely debated the topic of the death penalty was. It's certainly a topic that has many divided, which is why I'd like to know what you think. Do you agree with capital punishment? Do you think the punishment for Ronald was just? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative, please consider liking the video and sharing it with anyone you may know who also shares an interest in true crime. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and turn the notification bell on so you never miss an upload. And finally, Happy Halloween. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.